Um, and now for tonight's lecture. Dr. Rafe Sagren is a marine ecologist and environmental policy analyst at the University of Arizona. In both his science and policy work, Dr. Sagren connects basic observations of nature to issues of broad societal interest, including conservation biology, protecting public trust resources, and making responses to terrorism and other unpredictable events more adaptable. Dr. Sagren received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2011 for his work on his two recent books, Learning from the Octopus, which is also for sale outside, and Observation and Ecology, which show how nature observation observations and reveal is revealing profound new insight about our dynamic social and ecological world. He was a Congressional Science Fellow in the Office of U.S. Representative and later U.S. Secretary of Labor, Hilde, Hilde Solis. He has taught sociology, or I'm sorry, ecology and environmental policy at Duke University, California State University at Monterey Bay, Stanford University, University of California at Los Angeles, and the University of Arizona. His research has appeared in Science, Nature, Conservation Biology, uh, Trends in Ecology and Evolution, Foreign Policy, Homeland Security Affairs, and many other leading journals, magazines, and newspapers. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Rafe Siegman for tonight's lecture. All right. Um, it's really, really great to be here in space and time, um, to be back at this aquarium, which really was kind of a mecca for me as a child. I had to make and force my parents to make pilgrimages here. Um, and in time, in the sense that uh, my work is about how do we deal with unpredictable risks in our world, such as terrorism, which uh, we all experienced so um, closely recently. And uh, there's a lot of things that I, I won't be able to say about what happened last week in Boston, but I will talk about a few of those things um, and how they relate to the general idea uh, of what my book uh, and my work has been about, which is about what can we learn from nature about how to be adaptable to the unpredictable things that can happen in our world. My email is up here. Uh, I am not a reclusive J.D. Salinger type. Um, I like to talk to people. Uh, this kind of stuff generates ideas that sometimes takes a little while uh, to foment in your mind. So if you uh, find yourself with a response a week from now or a year from now, please feel free to uh, get in touch. And uh, I'll leave uh, plenty of time to talk uh, after the lecture. So here's the basic question that we're dealing with. What can we learn from nature about how to be adaptable? And um, I want to start with, with where this starts in, in kind of my life and this idea um, that life itself, our lives, and, uh, and the process of science and life larger than ourselves, lar life outside of humanity, is all what I call a recursive process. A recursive process is something that grows based on its past states and, and expands outward from that, like this spiral nautilus shell, um, or like a Fibonacci sequence, which is a mathematical way you can represent a spiral. It's something that needs information about the past to move into the future. Um, and that's how all life develops. And all recursive processes have a seed that they start with, something that gives them that initial energy and then they build off of it. And for a scientist, a life scientist, an ecologist, which is what I am, that seed is early experiences with observing nature. Um, so this is really where I got my start, uh, on the sand flats of Cape Cod Bay, where I did a lot of my growing up. Um, I did a lot of my growing up in Brewster, um, and, oops. Um, and with technology has been plaguing me all day. Um, on the sand flats of Brewster, later um, spent a lot of time on Dawson Beach, frying onion rings and clams at Philbrick's. If you ever had any of their great fried products in the 80s and 90s, most likely I made them for you. <laughs> I'm not still a fry cook. I didn't take a lot of that knowledge into, uh, into my future life, but certainly these early experiences um, staging hermit crab wars and seeing what washed up on that day's tide um, were incredibly uh, formative for my career 
uh, later as a marine ecologist. So it's sort of no surprise that I ended up, though, uh, across the continent on the west coast of the United States as a biologist studying the tide pools out there. But the thing about adaptation and about adapting to a changing world is that um, it's really about leaving or sometimes being pushed out of your comfort zone. Now my comfort zone was always the tide pools of, of Monterey. Uh, for years I lived out there in, in California and studied those tide pools. But on um, the day of 9-11, I had an infant daughter. Uh, we were out there, but I had very good friends, very close family in the State Department on Capitol Hill. Um, and we felt very far removed from what was going on there because we were in this beautiful coastline. Um, and I found myself less than a year later uh, very far outside of that comfort zone because I went up to Washington um, that year and I served as a science advisor to a congresswoman, a congresswoman Hilda Solis, who uh, became uh, the labor secretary later in Obama's first term. But here she was just starting as a congresswoman uh, in Washington. And I expected when I went there and took on my role that I would help the congresswoman with a lot of environmental issues. My research was on climate change. I'd help her with that. But um, that particular Congress, which actually looks quite a bit like our Congress today, uh, had absolutely no interest in doing any kind of environmental work or environmental legislation. And so I found myself way outside my comfort zone, um, not able to do the work I thought I would do. But what I was able to do, the skills that I could transfer, just like if you think of that early amphibian getting forced out of its comfort zone in the ocean and moving into a new area where it can find new opportunities, it takes a lot of what it had already. Again, that recursive growing process. It didn't just all of a sudden turn into an amphibian. It built off of what it had. What I had, which wasn't enormously useful in Washington, uh, I thought, was uh, my ability to observe ecosystems, to observe ecological relationships. And not having any tide pools to look at in Washington, D.C., the relationships that I was looking at, the ecosystem I was looking at, was this new terror response ecosystem that was emerging everywhere after 9-11, what I came to call an ecology of fear. And, and that's a term from a, a book by Mike Davis about the history of Los Angeles, but it's an apt term for what was going on in D.C. there. Everyone was incredibly scared. Um, and it was reflected in the architecture, uh, in Jersey barriers popping up everywhere around monuments, uh, new metal detectors everywhere. But very quickly, I seemed to understand that all this new security was coming up, but it wasn't changing at all. It was not adaptable. And it was really hit home one morning when I went into the house office building and I was fumbling to get my keys out of my pocket to put them on the metal detector. And some young staffer said to me, oh, don't bother taking your keys out of your pocket. Just put your hand over your keys in your pocket. You can walk right through the metal detectors. <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, if a staffer to save 20 seconds in the morning is going to adapt to these new security systems, what could a terrorist do? Um, that got me really thinking about what it means to be adaptable. And I realized, here's the thing that I actually love about biology, is that studying biology, you can spend a lifetime studying biology, you can become an expert on, say, the tide pool invertebrates of Monterey, California, and yet you'll still know about that much of the whole biological system. There's always new stuff to learn. So I knew that I knew very little, despite being a biologist, about what adaptation really is. And if I knew almost nothing about biology and I was a biologist, I knew close to zero about security. So what I decided to do is to bring together all the most creative and um, uh, interesting biologists that I knew that would be interested in looking at how can we adapt better to terrorism based on what we learned from biology, and from the people I had started to meet in Washington, D.C., all the most creative minds in security studies, people who had uh, been spies, and people who had worked for the United Nations Weapons Detection Program, and people who had been public health officials. Um, and I brought them all together to ask that question I put up at the beginning, which is what can we learn from nature 
about adapting to security challenges. And I brought them together in various kind of working groups where we just had completely open-ended discussions about any kind of biological organism we could learn from, any kind of security situation that we could learn from, and bringing them both together. And then I took those discussions to the people who are really working on the ground on security. <coughs> so through the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, which runs courses, they run a master's program in homeland security for people like these guys, police chiefs, fire chiefs, TSA agents, air marshals, the people who are right on the ground with the security issues. And I started bouncing the ideas off of them and saying, would this work in your situation? What is working? What's not working? And from all of this, starting to get a sense of not just what you could look at nature and say, okay, nature is adaptable, but what do you really learn from nature that's actionable, that you can turn into something we can do to keep ourselves safer, or we can do to adapt to the latest um, economic crisis, or something we can do to make our classrooms more adaptable to different learning styles. And so there's a few things that go on. The first general idea of biology is that it's all about living with risk. I say, the world's full of risk, but a fish doesn't try to turn a shark into a vegetarian. <laughs> so what I mean by that is the fish will do anything in its power not to get eaten by the shark. It will swim away, it'll hide, it may even form a partnership with the shark. But it doesn't have any sense that it's going to get rid of predation in the world. Predation is just out there. Risk is just out there, especially after 9-11. <clears throat> We did a lot, we put a lot of energy into thinking we could eliminate the risk. We had a war on terrorism. We have a war on drugs. In my own field, we have a war on invasive species. All of these indicate that we could have a total victory over these things, and we can't because they're connected to much larger sources of risk. So biology is about living with that risk, but it's not a passive sort of well, I'm just going to live with it. It's out there. There's all sorts of things biology does to mitigate or to lessen that risk. Here's the other thing that's great about biology. It's an enormous sample size. Everything living, everything that has ever lived on this earth for three and a half billion years has to deal with the same problem we deal with, which is that risk is everywhere and it's almost completely unpredictable. So you want to look for places where there's a lot of experience. It's like Harvard Business School goes to their big database of uh, case studies of different businesses. Well, this is the biggest database ever. Biology is the biggest database about how to live in a risk-filled world. The other thing, and this is something that a lot of people don't get, is that biology is basically about cooperation. And early ecologists, Back in the early 20th century, people like this guy, Warder Ali, who was at the University of Chicago, actually understood this very well. And that understanding kind of disappeared in the 20th century, where we thought biology was all about some kind of uh, economic kind of uh, maximization formula or something. And um, what Ali recognized is that Biology primarily trends towards cooperation. I'll, I'll get back to him in a bit, but what he's saying here, he's talking about, uh, he's writing in the um, periods between the world wars, he's saying um, the present system of international relations is biologically unsound. Attempts to provide biological respectability to the existing system by saying it's, it's just the inevitable struggle for survival. So people would say, well, war is natural because all biological things fight all the time. He was saying that's actually not right at all because there's a fundamental biological principle of cooperation that actually drives things, and I'll, I'll get back to that. Now, this is a personal hero of mine, um, Ed Ricketts. He was a student of Warder Ali's. He is a marine biologist who lived on Cannery Row in the early 20th century in Monterey. He was a very good friend of John Steinbeck's, and he appears in several of John Steinbeck's novels. Um, he was also incredibly influential on the mythologist Joseph Campbell, who was another good friend of his. He's this sort of professional marine biologist, philosopher, um, um, sort of social hub in his little laboratory where they'd have these massive parties 
Uh, even during Prohibition, they used the alcohol he used to uh, pickle specimens, and they distilled it down into this horrid-sounding uh, libation, and they would have three-day-long parties that would go on and on, and they'd philosophize and read poetry, and um, it's amazing the number of 20th century intellectuals that went through his lab, uh, people like Henry Miller as well, as well as um, local prostitutes and, and homeless people, um, and just anyone who wanted to come by. But one of the things that Ricketts was um, interested in is what do you learn by stripping off all the humanity and the, what he calls the worded idealisms that we get into when we argue uh, about different things as humans. And he said, you know, if you look at animals, there's this great advantage because they just are what they are. You just look at them, and if you're careful enough of an observer, you can find some pretty interesting things, and you don't have to worry about all those layers of politics when people say one thing but really mean another thing. And we see that all the time in the responses on these news channels about, um, well, this is what I think is going on, and you know there's, ah, there's some kind of political agenda under it. What is the political agenda by which he's making this point? Animals don't have that problem. You can just read them directly. So here's a few things, generally, about looking at these animals. Sorry. Um, Don't touch it. <laughs> it's the best advice ever. Um, the basic ground rules of how organisms work uh, in this unpredictable environment. And they're a little <laughs> counterintuitive to the way we think about solving problems. Natural organisms don't plan, they don't predict, and they don't try to be perfect. So I'll break that down a little bit. If I asked any of you to plan a fish for me. Plan a really good fish for me. Give me your best blueprint for a fish. None of you would come up with a fish that looks like this. <laughs> this is the mola mola. It's the ocean sunfish. A fish so ridiculous and weird looking that even when you see them live, you cannot believe you're seeing a living creature. They're enormous, ungainly, weird things and yet they've been incredibly successful. They've lived for millions of years. They're the largest bony fish on Earth. They've been successful by solving problems in their environment, by finding a niche where they could work. They didn't have a plan to end up like this ugly thing, but they work really well, even though they're in this very unusual shape. Organisms can't really predict the future, but beyond very simple things like day-night cycles or tidal cycles. An attempt to predict the future in a complex world is only going to waste resources, and so it gets selected out. Now sometimes we think animals are predicting the future, like the um, elephants and dogs and other creatures that ran uphill well in advance of the Asian tsunami, of the Boxing Day tsunami. They weren't predicting the future. They were going back to that basic force, that observational sense, and they may have used um, uh, magnetic or chemical sense or visual sense of something that was going on that morning that was different than their usual pattern um, that allowed them to understand that a big change was coming well in advance. That time I didn't touch anything. <laughs> there we go. Um, finally, uh, organisms don't aim for perfection. And this is often misconstrued about biology. People sometimes use that term survival of the fittest. It's not about survival of the fittest. It's about survival of the good enough to reproduce yourself, and that's all you need to do. You just have to be good enough. And um, 
what I hear sometimes, like on the Discovery Channel during Shark Week, they'll say, the great white shark, nature's perfect predator. And I always say, you know, it would be so much better if it had laser beam eyes. <laughs> the point is, there's no way to measure perfection in nature. You could always do something better, but it doesn't matter. The great white shark is a really great predator. It doesn't have to be the best predator or the most perfect predator. It just has to solve problems in its environment. So here's the thing. Nature tells us what you need to do to adapt, but it also tells us how to do it. And so you can break down the basic things you'd want to do to be adaptable, and then find an analog in nature for each of these things. To be adaptable, you need to observe carefully the environment and be able to respond to changes very quickly. You need to be able to communicate about what's going on among your friends and among your enemies. You need to be able to identify with those organisms that are going to help you and those organisms that are going to get in your way. And you need to be able to expand your adaptability because every single organism reaches the limits of how much it can adapt. And you need to stretch that out when you hit a wall. And you need to be able to iterate or reproduce what you've done. It's not good enough to adapt once to a problem. You need to be able to continually adapt. And in nature, all of that happens through these different processes, through being decentralized, through signaling across species sometimes, through cultures that develop, and all organisms have cultures, uh, loosely, uh, loosely termed cultures, uh, through symbiotic partnerships, and through learning from success. And I'm going to give now some examples of how nature does this. And the examples I'm going to give are going to be from all over. They're going to be from nature. They're going to be from organizations of humans or companies that do this really well. They're going to be from individuals, um, and some of them are even going to be from very recent events here. So um, I'm going to go all over the place, but they're going to really follow this framework. The first idea that nature observes and responds to change through decentralized systems, ways of allowing independent agents to sense change for you. This idea comes from this remarkable man who was part of these early working groups I put together. His name is Gary Vermey. He's one of the best living naturalists that I know of. He can identify any kind of fossilized uh, shell uh, or, or um, crustaceans, gastropods, everything, and um, anything you put in his hands. And you have to put it in his hands because he's been blind since he was three years old. He can see things on this shell with his fingers that I cannot see with my eyes. Uh, he's an incredible observer, and um, what he does with all his observations is put them together into a story of life and what have been the most successful organisms on Earth. And what he suggests is that having a decentralized way to sense change is one of these keys. And to give some examples to, to how this look, what this looks like, take an octopus, <coughs> my favorite animals. The octopus um, has a wonderful brain. Um, it has a cognitive mind. It can think. It can do all sorts of things. It's very similar to us in a way. It's got this wonderful brain, but when it wants to camouflage itself very quickly, it doesn't have that awesome brain say, okay, I know what to do. Arm one, turn red. Arm two, you've got to turn purple. Uh, arm three, do you know what chartreuse is? You've got to turn kind of chartreuse. Um, that would be really uh, a lot of waste of time, and it wouldn't be too effective. So rather, it has millions of skin cells all over its body, which each individually sense the environment around them and change to that color and that shape, so that as a whole, collectively, the octopus becomes camouflaged, rather um, than the centralized way. Our immune system is like this. It's a bunch of cells running around our body, looking for invaders, responding to those invaders without any conference calls to our brain. It doesn't say, should I take these out now? It just does it. Every cell doing its job to collectively give us our immunity. We tend to centralize when we're worried. We put things into programs and departments because we think there's certain expertise out there that will help us solve a problem. 
First thing we did after 9-11 is we created the Department of Homeland Security. First major security crisis after 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, and the big question was, where's FEMA? Where's the Federal Emergency Management Agency? If you want to find a government agency, you've got to look at the org chart. There's FEMA. It's stuck in this centralized, top-down bureaucracy. I mean, other boxes here, are th they're not trivial. They're things like the Coast Guard. These huge organizations all tied up into this hierarchy where they've got to go almost all the way to the top and back down before they can make decisions. And so it's very clear in some cases why you weren't getting that responsiveness. I'll have more positive examples in a second. But <laughs> the related concept here is that nature uses redundancy in all kinds of ways to be able to solve unexpected problems. We think of redundancy as wasteful, as inefficient. We're always trying to get rid of redundant parts. But nature is actually collecting redundant parts and using them in different ways. This is also an idea from Gary Vermeer. There's simple redundancy in nature, like a centipede that has multiple walking legs. Loses a few legs, no big deal. But when you really are successful is when you take redundant parts and creatively shift them to different uses like the beetles have done. Beetles are so successful that biologist J.B.S. Haldane was asked, what do all your studies of nature tell you about the creator? And he said, well, God must have an enormous fondness for beetles. <laughs> because beetles are everywhere, and what they've done is they've taken those repeated parts and specialized them into claws and wings and devices for shooting chemical weapons, all these different ways of responding to a potential problem. Put these two things together, decentralized sensing and redundant ways of responding, and you can get some really amazing responses um, that are fast, cheap, and highly effective. So, on the day of 9-11, you had a major problem, which was that thousands of people were stranded in Lower Manhattan with nowhere to go. But you had individual, not a department of boat owners, but individual boat owners who said, oh my god, there's all these people I see on TV stuck in Manhattan. I got a boat. I could go get some of them. And I'm going to call my buddy who has a boat and get him to go down there and get them. You had a completely spontaneous boat lift by boat owners who saw what was going on, responded to it. This was the, one of the largest mass evacuations of people in history, and it all occurred on the spot by those individuals sensing change. Now, you can institutionalize this kind of activity. Google is brilliant at doing this. Google is set up as an adaptable company. And uh, one of the things, one of the ways they use this, one of their products is called Google Flu Trans. This is using all of us as the octopus skin cells sensing change because when we type into Google, do I have flu? What are flu symptoms? What are flu remedies? Google's tracking that and creating a trace of high incidences and low incidences of when people are looking for flu related terms. That trace matches perfectly the Centers for Disease Control's flu trends with one difference. The Centers for Disease Control sends out surveys to doctors and hospitals and gets them back and then uh, analyzes the data and publishes the data two weeks later then Google Flu Trends can give you the exact same data and two weeks with a potential flu epidemic is an enormous amount of time so that really illustrates the advantage of using a lot of different sensors to respond to change in the environment Okay, animals communicate to one another to mitigate or lower the risk that they face. They live in a risk-filled world, but they use communication strategies, sometimes announcing, like this coral snake, that they're poisonous with their colors, but sometimes actually talking to their adversaries in their adversaries' language. And this is one of my favorite recent science stories. You wouldn't think there's anything new to learn about a ground squirrel, but we learned recently that ground squirrels have this amazing communication system. What they do is, if they see a predator, they will signal to their predator that they see the predator because that says you can't sneak up on me. Lots of prey species do this, but ground squirrels do it in an amazing way. When they see a hawk or a coyote, they make a loud call. They say you can't sneak up on me. When they see a snake, they don't make any call because snakes don't hear. 
would be lost on the snake. What they do is they raise up their tail and they puff it up in kind of a menacing way. And if, and only if, that snake is a rattlesnake, they also heat up their tail because rattlesnakes see in infrared. So they are sending signals to their enemy in the enemy's language, very precise. We tend to do a poor job of this. This is an example of when we wanted to send a signal to our enemy, namely uh, radicalized Muslims, after we killed Osama bin Laden. The CIA released videos to uh, news agencies which appeared to people watching them, and apparently to all the news agencies that reported this straight, that Osama bin Laden in his final days was this pathetic person who was sitting on the floor of this decrepit house, bobbing up and down, completely disheveled. We wanted to show, hey, this guy is no hero. He's a loser. And we sent out all these news reports, videos demystify the Osama bin Laden legend. This was received exactly in the opposite way by radical Muslims. Because here they saw a man who was in hiding, who kept his beard, as the prophet would have wanted him to, a rich man who was living in humble conditions, as the prophet would have wanted him to, a man who was still praying ritualistically. Every signal in that video reinforced to radical Muslims the greatness of this man, not the story we wanted to tell. <coughs> Now, every organism on Earth since the beginning of time has needed a way to identify what is like itself against what is not like itself. It's so uh, apparent we don't even think about this, but you need to have a system to say, oh, I should mate with that organism, or I should avoid that organism, or I should form a partnership with that organism. That thing is different than me in some way. Every organism has a different way of doing this. For salmon, it's encased in their incredible uh, sensory abilities to identify their exact natal stream bank where they came from so that they can identify exactly who's going to come back to that stream and be enough like them that they'd be a good mate choice. For humans, we don't smell so well, but we uh, take on this process through culture and we have all kinds of cultural ways to identify what is like ourselves and what isn't like ourselves and this was essential for 99% of the time we lived on Earth, when we lived in very small groups, in very, very dangerous conditions, we needed to identify who is in our group. And groups were so important to us because none of us could do it alone. We just could not survive on our own. So culture became the way that we developed this. And through time, it especially became part of written culture and spoken culture, which was a very strong separator between us and them us and the rest of the wild world, or us and another culture uh, in another part of uh, our world. We call this tribalism. And we tend to think of tribalism as the root of conflict. We talk a lot, especially after 9-11, about how much tribalism separates us and causes people to identify with violent causes because they're so fixed on what their tribe believes is right. And there is no doubt that there have been horrible, horrible events that have occurred throughout history because of a strong sense of tribalism. I don't want to deny that I'm going to talk about it directly. But I want to argue here that this is partly a very biased reading of history. It's easy to focus on these things and easy to forget that there is a massive, massive advantage of having strong tribes. And we're going to see why, why that's important. But first, I want to talk about the conflict side of this. People like Ed Ricketts, this biologist I talked about, early ecologists, were very interested in figuring out what biology tells us about getting through conflict. Um, and Ricketts had this idea that breaking through kind of tribal conflicts, or any kind of conflicts, conflict between a husband and a wife, different examples he uses, breaking through that conflict would never happen by making concessions, by compromising away those things that identify why you're in that tribe to begin with, but would only occur if both sides deeply understood 
the root causes of why that tribe or why that person has a certain belief, why that tribe exists. Years later, uh, people that I worked with, like Scott Atran, he's an anthropologist who works with some of the most radical populations, who works with the most radical Palestinians, the most radical Israelis, and tries to figure out what would cause them to come to the bargaining table. And he came to roughly the same ideas that he said that tribes identify themselves by their sacred values, things that they think define them and that they'll never give up. And if you try to offer some kind of trade-off or compromise about those sacred values, say, well, if you just gave up that idea that's causing so much problems, we'll give you this much money or we'll give you this much land, that actually causes people to harden their beliefs because they think you're, you're cheapening their sacred values by putting a price on them. And so this is also the same idea in, in uh, kind of one of the modern uh, Bibles on negotiation called Getting to Yes. It's the same idea, how to, how to come to an agreement without giving in, without <coughs> compromising. Because you don't compromise away those things that make you connected to your tribe. What Atran suggests, though, is that you can make what he calls materially irrelevant compromises or what he calls symbolic trade-offs, and I'll give examples of this, that can open the door to the other side. A symbolic trade-off is when you offer something that is incredibly important to the identity of the person or group you're fighting with, but may not cost you a lot to give that thing. Um, he talks about an example, uh, which he calls ping-pong diplomacy. When we wanted to open the door to negotiations with China, um, we sent a bunch of ping pong players to China, our national ping pong team. And guess what? Our national ping pong team got their asses kicked by the Chinese. Um, and no one in America cared. <laughs> because no one cares about ping pong here except um, maybe that actress. That's Sigourney Weave? No. Whoever has the gym in New York. Anyway, uh, no one cared about ping pong. But for the Chinese, this was a glorious, fantastic victory over this superpower. And more importantly, it showed the Chinese who were somewhat skeptical about our motivations, that this isn't a country that wants to be the dominating superpower at, at all costs. It's willing to lose on a national stage. It will, it's willing to uh, give up something. It wasn't the end of opening the door to China. It just opened it a crack, this symbolic concession. A, a more recent example, which is very powerful, um, is the story of Nelson Mandela and the Springbok rugby team after the fall of, of, of apartheid, when Mandela became president. And uh, this was retold in the recent movie Invictus with Matt Damon uh, and Morgan Freeman. But the story is that um, Nelson Mandela's people really wanted to get rid of the Springbok rugby team. To them, to black South Africans, it was a symbol of racial oppression. It was a symbol of apartheid and white rule. Black people weren't playing rugby. It was Afrikaners who were playing rugby, and it was part of what they were. And Mandela, because of his great observational senses, unfortunately forced upon him by spending years and years and years on Robben Island prison and observing Afrikaners at close range, which many uh, black South Africans did not, recognized that this was a sacred value to white South Africans. The Springbok rugby team was a symbol of their culture. And he recognized that all he would have to give up by keeping the spring box is a, a form of petty revenge, one more aspect of a, a little revenge on the apartheid regime. And so he said, we're going to keep them, and we're going to elevate them, and we're going to honor them, because this is so important to them. That act didn't solve racial problems in South Africa, but it certainly opened white South Africans to the idea that this man wasn't going to come back into power and just eliminate everything that they believed in and all their cultural identifiers. But now moving to the good side of tribalism, because I think overall the overwhelming force in evolutionary history is that tribalism has been incredibly important to human beings. It's been incredibly important in our early history. It's been incredibly important in our more recent history. This is the tribalism of the early colonies fighting against this empire. 
And it's really important now, right now in this period of history, because what was attacked last week was two very strong tribes. Boston is a city, a unique city of course, but perhaps unique in this sense, or at least throughout the world, a city that has one of the strongest tribal identities, the strongest identity as a city. And I talked about how tribal identity is uh, reinforced by language and by um, all sorts of identifiers. I love this sign from the first Bruins game after the attack. It says, we are Boston strong. <laughs> it's a language, it's, a, it's a, 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 an identifier that is uniquely attributed to, the, to this tribe. Um, runners are also a tribe. Runners have a whole set of myths and identities that unites them. Uh, this is a set of ads uh, from Adidas from a few years back that I love. The tagline is, runners were different, and they had these different images. I think this is from Boston. Here's this runner, and he's, he's uh, blowing what we call a snot rocket. <laughs> and there's this woman just off the frame with this disgusted face. So there's this kind of us versus them mentality. And this one really gets at the evolutionary part of tribes, because here is uh, a pregnant woman running with her little toddler. And here's the normal family off to the side with their normal stroller and their toddler there, and they're kind of looking at her askance. Um, just identifying that, yes, runners were different, were this tribe. And these two tribes, um, you know, were attacked, but also are the source of healing and of gathering the resources um, that are needed to be a part of responding to this event. Because strong tribes actually attract cooperation. Because it's in our mindset, it's in our evolutionary mindset that we live in these small groups. And when we can identify with that group and that group is under attack, our feeling is that we are under attack. And so if you have this strong tribal identity and everyone knows what Boston is about, it's about being scrappy and fighting against you know, the evil empire of the British or the evil empire of the Yankees. Um, and people identify with it all over and they want to cooperate with that tribe that's under attack because they think it's their tribe at least temporarily so i love this sign from hopkinton where they have their own identity as the start of the marathon but then they're saying we're with you all the way through uh in my own town of tucson just a day after the attacks my local running shop organized a run to benefit the victims of Boston. I'm sure that happened at running shops all over the country, the running tribe connecting to the Boston tribe. We even see the Yankee fans temporarily <laughs> this tribe. I don't think you're ever going to hear Sweet Caroline sung again at Yankee Stadium, but they did. And I wanted to make that point very specifically because people might look at that skeptically, just as when um, Governor Christie temporarily teamed up with President Obama after Superstorm Sandy. People thought, well, maybe it's political. It's not going to last. No, of course it's not going to last. They're going to go back to their corners as soon as they can. And Yankees fans will continue to hate Red Sox fans and vice versa. But the point is that these kind of cooperative relationships, which in nature we call symbiosis, occur across a vast spectrum. There's no perfect symbiotic relationship. Organisms can come together for the briefest of moments to solve a problem, or they can come together for so long that they become inseparable from one another. Symbiosis is the way that all organisms, which always run into the limits of their adaptability, expand their ability to adapt. Every single living organism on Earth has a partnership with many, many other organisms. And these partnerships and this was a lot of Warder Ali's work, often come out of relationships that used to be antagonistic towards one another. So you have conflict developing into cooperation. And they occur between some of the most unlikely partners. So this little cleaning fish will go right into the mouth of this predatory fish to clean out its parasites. And symbiotic partnerships 
we're learning, create what we call emergent properties. These are things you wouldn't predict just from the adding of one and one together. So for example, this fish, this big predatory fish, becomes much less aggressive to all the fish on that particular reef patch when these cleaning stations are set up. That's not something you predict. It's not something either of them plan to have happen. It just happened as a result of this partnership. Now, we tend to view our enemies as something we can put a wall up and keep them away from us because we undervalue the ability to form partnerships. We put up walls against our enemies. This is the border wall right near my house in southern Arizona. Symbiotic partnerships can break down these walls in remarkable ways. This is a man I work with, Terry Taylor, uh, who I've worked with from the beginning of this project. If you looked at his resume, you'd be looking at the resume of James Bond, basically, for the first part of his life. But later in life, after leaving British Secret Service, he became involved in biological and chemical weapons reduction, worked for the UN, he continues to work for the UN on this. But one of the things that he came across during this is he recognized that we can't just fight weaponized biological uh, and chemical weapons because that's a very rare likelihood of those occurring. What we need to do is work on public health systems that prepare us for any kind of thing that can happen with biology. It could be a natural outbreak, it could be a lab accident, or an act of terrorism. And that idea got him thinking about how do we deal with public health in general and got him working in places like the Middle East where he has helped to set up partnerships, in this case, between Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian doctors and health uh, officials and uh, nurses who are all working together to stop the spread of infectious disease. Because these people recognize that an infectious disease doesn't care about what map you have or where the lines are drawn or where the wall has been laid down. Those diseases are going to kill you way before the politics do. So these guys focus intently on fighting disease and sharing information and cures and patient records. Um, I did say that biology isn't about perfection. These guys aren't working together to create peace in the Middle East. That is not one of their goals. It's not on their agenda. They're working intently on the problem at hand. And by focusing on that, they are creating a working partnership that actually may have that emergent effect of being a step towards peace in the Middle East. But that's not what the goal is at the outset. That's not the plan. The plan is solve the problem. Now Terry's been replicating those kinds of partnerships in six countries around the Mekong River, which are no less friendly towards one another, where those partnerships are working beautifully, and in Southern Africa. And that leads to the last aspect of adaptable systems, which is that when something works, learn from it and replicate it. The most adaptable organisms learn from success. We hear a lot these days, especially from kind of these business guru types, these organizational gurus that we've got to learn from failure. And it sounds really good at first, like I am going to own up to my failures and I'm going to learn from it. Learning from failure is an evolutionary dead end. It means you died and you didn't reproduce yourself and your line is done. That's it. There's no benefit in failure. Learning from success is the feedback process, that recursive process where you build from something that worked into something that works a little better in the future. And the success is the only platform you have to figure out what's going to work in a natural system. So you might as well build off of that. We tend to overwhelmingly focus on our failures when we think about what went wrong in a situation. Hurricane Katrina, a lot of things went wrong in Katrina. And I, I actually have no problem with spending some time to look at what went wrong, especially really stupid mistakes. You want to know what the stupid mistakes were so you don't repeat them. Like when NASA sends up a satellite and half the engineers were working in metrics and half were working in English and the satellite crashes, that's just a dumb mistake that you don't want to repeat. So identify it and say everyone work in metrics or everyone work in English, but don't mix it up. Um, Hurricane Katrina had a huge after action report. What went wrong during Katrina called the Townsend After Action Report? Over a hundred different recommendations about things that went wrong. There's almost nothing in this report about what went right. 
And a lot of things actually did go right in the response to Katrina. Just one of those things was that the Coast Guard cleaned up a nine, contained and cleaned up a nine million gallon oil spill. None of that is in the after action report. I learned it from a student of mine who was a Coast Guard lieutenant. Um, when would it be useful to know about cleaning up oil in the Gulf of Mexico <laughs> under really, oh right, the very next disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, which was Deepwater Horizon. The one thing you really wanted to learn from Katrina that would have helped you at Deepwater Horizon is how to clean up oil in a difficult circumstances. But it wasn't part of our institutional knowledge at that point because we focused so much on failure and not on success. So the question is, well, we're this amazing species. We're almost every bit as good as those beetles. We've gone all over the world. We're incredibly adaptable. Um, but almost as an outcome of the very wonderful thing that for most people living on Earth now, most people, not all people, we don't live in a day-to-day -day struggle to survive. And we've been somewhat insulated from that pressure of selection that causes most organisms to adapt. Overall, that's a great thing. We don't want to be on the other side of that equation. And we've, through our culture, through our technologies, and all kinds of things, gotten stepped off of that a little bit. But because of that, it's made us vulnerable through time to being not as adaptable as we could be. And so how do we start becoming adaptable again? How do we develop adaptable systems that don't fall into the problem of natural adaptable systems, which is that a lot of things die and suffer on the path to species becoming adaptable? And it turns out there's a very easy thing we can do to set off a sort of cascade of adaptability that can generate its own momentum to continue to adapt because we don't want to just adapt once. Oh, we adapted that problem, we're done. You have to continually be adaptable. And the way we do this is we stop giving orders and we start issuing challenges. So an order is when one person or a group of people says, we're the experts, we know what to do, all of you go do it. A challenge, by contrast, is when that same group or individual says, we're facing a problem here, everyone. Who among you can help us solve this problem? Get to work on it. What a challenge does is it sets off every aspect of these adaptable systems that I talked about. It activates those decentralized and redundant sensors of the problem. So all kinds of people respond to a challenge. And the example, um, that I have, because what you also get is the redundant responders. You get all kinds of individuals with different skills coming to address that challenge. I put up a boat in the last, a ship in the last um, slide, because one of the first challenges that we know of was uh, in the early 1700s. Sailors didn't know what their longitude was at sea, and a lot of ships and lives and treasure were going to the bottom of the sea because you couldn't calculate your longitude and you might run into a reef because you didn't know exactly where you were. So English Parliament did a clever thing because most people thought our astronomers, our experts on navigation will come up with an answer to this soon. But English Parliament, instead of hiring uh, an astronomer consultant and say, solve this problem for us, they issued a challenge. And they said, anyone, help us figure out this challenge and we'll give you a big prize. And it turned out not to be an astronomer, but a watchmaker who responded to this and recognized if he could make a very accurate chronometer that could keep time at sea in a way that no previous clock could do, he could solve this challenge. So it was a result of going out to everyone that this unlikely solution came back. And when you uh, develop challenges, you develop symbiotic partnerships because people recognize, well, I can solve part of this problem, but I'm gonna need to work with um, an engineer to make this happen, or I'm gonna need to work with a writer uh, who can help me articulate what I'm talking about. So symbiotic partnerships develop. Sometimes you can use our tribalism to make challenges work better. So in biology we had a big problem which is that we couldn't possibly understand all the different ways that proteins could be folded into forms that worked in nature. Um, and biologists who are experts on proteins had battled with this challenge for years and years and years. But 
One clever group of biologists created a video game that they put up online. And what you had was teams of gamers competing against one another online for the prestige of being the best gamers. And they were given a simple set of rules about what was biologically feasible with proteins. And the goal was to come up with all kinds of confirmations of proteins that would actually work in nature. And within a very, very short period of time, these tribes of gamers competing against one another came up with many solutions that biologists hadn't even been aware of. And when you organize a challenge well, um, you'll recognize that we need to learn from the successes and reiterate or make more challenges to help people solve more complex problems. So if you look at, there's some, so many amazing examples of challenge-based problem solving going on right now. And they're coming from all kinds of sources, like DARPA, which is an agency within this huge bureaucracy known as the Department of Defense, doesn't develop new military technology by going to a single source contractor and saying, here's a bunch of money, give me something that doesn't do what I asked you to do, 20 years too late, and I'll keep giving you money until, um, until you say stop. Because uh, that's typically how it works. Uh, what they do is they say, here's a problem we have. We, we need a vehicle that can autonomously, without a human controller, navigate a complex course. And anyone who solves this challenge will get a huge prize. One million dollars. That's what I call couch change to the Department of Defense. It's nothing. Um, and in fact, even the respondents to this challenge, which tend to be university uh, engineering departments, who are again competing against one another, um, probably spend more than a million dollars solving this challenge. For them, the motivation is being seen as the best engineering department. So it's Stanford versus Carnegie Mellon versus MIT. Um, and the prize money is actually irrelevant. It's about solving the challenge and showing your chops. Um, 3M is not a company like Google. It's not a big, you know, startup, high-flying, adaptable company. It's solid blue chip Fortune 500 company. When they wanted to reduce their environmental footprint, they didn't have the CEO send a memo to everyone and say, everyone recycle 20% more, do it now. Uh, what they did is they issued a challenge. They said, anyone in this organization help us reduce our environmental impact. And so what you had is you had administrative assistants over here who understood their world saying, oh yeah, we could change some things and reduce a whole bunch of paper waste. And you had chemists over here saying, oh yeah, you know, if you let us rearrange these fume hoods, we could reduce chemical waste by this much. So you had individuals responding to the problem in their area and collectively saving the company hundreds of millions of dollars, massively reducing its environmental footprint, all employees got for participants, they had 8,000 different successful products come up, pro, uh, projects come out of this challenge. All people got for participating was like a certificate of achievement. Here's the amazing thing about challenges. If the people you issue the challenge to believe in the mission of what you're doing, they will jump on it with virtually no incentive except to support that mission. So for example, when I talk to the Red Cross, that is an organization where from the top to the bottom, from the CEO to the person handing out sandwiches on a volunteer basis, everyone believes in the mission of the Red Cross. So they can challenge their employees to solve problems of their volunteers. Um, I start doing this in my classes now. Um, uh, I, I, for years, um, would show the mocking slide of the Department of Homeland Security even to DHS people, and, and they'd get a laugh out of it. But then I started looking at my own classes at the university, and I recognized, I, I run this ship just like the Department of Homeland Security. I'm the boss at the top. I tell all the students who are expected to be lined up like those boxes, here's what you're going to learn based on this syllabus that I give them at the beginning of the semester. That's the plan for the whole semester. Um, as if I could predict, especially in my field of environmental science, what amazing new environmental science stories are going to come out. So I started turning the tide on myself and issuing a challenge to my classes. And the challenge is on the first day of class, I rip up the syllabus and I say, you guys are here. You want to learn about environmental science. What exactly do you want to learn about and what could you teach your fellow students? about it. And what they do is they, on the spot, come up with a syllabus for the whole semester based on their interests, what they want to learn. And before every single class, every student contributes something related to the main theme of the class the next day uh, that's related to um, 
that so every student, and they put it up on a, on a course wiki site that we have, so we create a website where everyone's put some contribution to this class. If the class is about shark conservation, everyone puts up something, maybe a video they saw on shark uh, uh, hunting, or um, one student I had one year put up his wedding menu because he was a Chinese student. And one of the big problems with shark conservation is that a lot of sharks are being killed for shark fin soup for Chinese weddings. And he put up his menu because he said, look, there's no symbols for shark fin soup on my wedding. And let me tell you guys how nearly impossible it was for my bride and I to have a wedding in Hong Kong without shark fin soup on the, on the menu. This is a story that came spontaneously into the class, so much more powerful to those students than if I just lectured and said, well, there's a bunch of trade to Asia about shark fin soup, and it's because of this wedding thing. I mean, I'm so far removed from that. But this kid was in it very thick, and every student around him could understand the pressure of parents and everything, and planning a wedding and all that kind of thing, so they could see it much more clearly. I could never have predicted in my syllabus that this would have been an important contribution to the class. I had to open it to challenge the students to bring the information into the class. And there's other fields where they're just starting uh, to get into this idea. What can we do in international peace building that's challenge-based rather than the UN saying, you guys need to get along, or one country saying, you guys need to get along? What is the challenge that everyone's primed for uh, to build more peace in the world? So the basic idea of all my work is uh, in this uh, particular book and the, and the work around it is that wherever the future is full of risk and unpredictable is a place where we can adopt adaptable strategies or adaptable solutions. And I've developed this website to sort of talk about the broad sweep of where lessons from nature can apply, whether it's business or teaching or security. Um, and I invite you to go there um, and continue the dialogue with me at any time. Like I said, I, I get the most value out of feedback I get from the people I talk to about these ideas and they're continually growing and changing just like life itself. Thank you very much. For being here.